Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the podcast this time, we have a cave murder, a donkey story, unknown eyes, and even a spirit who throws people around. Ron, surely we can't have all of that? British guy, we do, and even more. How is that even possible? We like to think big around here. We have the conclusion to our story, The Diamond Thunderbolt, and we end the program with more old-time radio commercials. How much are you charging? Not a red penny, or any other color for that matter. Shall we get started? This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by a college education. While it won't help you with murder, it will lead to bigger and better things. After all, I have a college education in... Uh, well, maybe I'm not the best example, but... Oh, heck, let's just listen to this week's story. Our story takes place in Green's Gap a small town in the Southern Cavern District. Rain's Gap Hospital, Dr. Melville speaking. Doctor, doctor, there's been an accident out in Echo Cavern. Accident? What kind of accident? Two men was exploring, and they got lost last night. One's unconscious. You better come quick before he's dead. You know how to get out to Echo Cavern, Lem. Yeah, the being town constable and ambulance driver, I reckon I know about all there is to know about this country. Ever been in the cavern, Lem? One stock, Melville, when I was a boy. <laughs> Nearly got my heart hand off of my paw. Echo Cavern's a mighty treacherous place. You mean it's uh, easy to get lost in? Yeah, not only that, Doc. It's had cavern gas, carbine uh, shunting. Carbon dioxide? Yes, that's it. All of a sudden, you run into some of that stuff, and before you know it, then you're out. Still, people seem to go exploring there. More fools you be. I wouldn't go into them caverns. Least twice not without a dog. A dog? What for? Well, if a dog keels over, then you know the gas is collecting. I'm afraid, Mr. Gatty, your friend is dead. Yeah, poor Patsy. It was from the gas, wasn't it, Doc? That's what it looks like to me. And why did you go in that cavern anyway? Well, Patsy asked me to. He never seen a cave before. How far did you go in? Well, it didn't seem very far, but all of a sudden we lost our way. Well, where was that? Well, how do I know whereabouts it was if we was lost? We, we tried to trace our way back, but it wasn't no use. And Patsy started to get scared. It's kind of funny to see a big guy like that get scared. Yeah, see... He's rather big, isn't he? Yeah, six foot four. The mob used to call us Mutton Jeff. And then what happened? Well, I was a little scared myself. But we stuck together, you know, walking in the dark with only my flash in the car. And all of a sudden, Patsy keeled over. From the gas? Yeah, that's what I figured. His head hit on a rock, and I guess that just about finished him off. Yeah. I suppose you reckon yourself pretty lucky, mister. Yeah, sure. I I figure it was only because I'm five foot three that I got out of there alive. And the gas must have been just about a foot over my head. Yeah. And what do you think of that, Jock Melville? I think you'd better arrest Mr. Getty for the murder of his friend, Patsy. What was the flaw in Getty's story? Do you know it? In a moment, we'll hear from Lamb and Dr. Melville. But first... use of dogs. I have half a mind to contact the SPCA. The problem is, well, this happened over 70 years ago, and from my research, the practice of the use of short dogs to detect gas has been replaced with short robots. And hey, that's okay with me. Go back to our story. And now, let's see whether you're as observant as Lamb and the Doctor. Hey, copper, let me put my hands down. They're tired. When you're in Green's Gap Jail, not before. Ah, I don't get it. 
It was a good story. I still can't figure how you found out. Lem tells me they used to take dogs in the cavern because the gas is heavier than air. It collects on the floor. If you really met gas, you would have keeled over first before your pal Patsy. Well, what do you know? I tell you, nowadays in this murder racket, you need a college education. Gas is heavier than air? Not always true. Take, for example, helium. It's lighter than air and therefore would affect the tall guy first. Oh, of course, our guy wouldn't pass out and hit his head. He would just talk funny and over time might act a bit silly. So, I guess you can say this one's confirmed. With a caveat, of course. A couple of you wrote in about the podcast last week. The sound was off in a few places. I do apologize for that. During the interview with Jason, I forgot to start up the support software for my mixer. That takes care of compression and equalization. I'll try not to forget that in the future. I actually blame Jason. I'm not sure why, but it seems like the right thing to do. I received this email from Paul Knight of Nightbird, Texas. Hey Ron, I wanted to correct something that you said about the dogmen. It's not a big deal, but they've also been seen heavily in Brazil and other places in Central America. I'm a follower of the beast and I like to read and track their stories. In fact, I have a recording of one if you're interested. I've never seen one myself, but it's not from lack of trying. Paul. I wrote Paul back and asked for that recording. Here is what he sent us. Be ready though, because this is quite chilling. Crazy stuff. That does not sound like your normal wolf. This recording came from a dogman researcher named Davis. It was recorded in upstate New York late one night while researching. Very creepy. Thank you, Paul, for sending that in to us. One more thing this week. I'm looking at doing another ghost theme show, so I am looking for your scary stories about ghosts. I'm also looking for a co-host for this, so if you have any suggestions, or even want to apply for the job, let me know. Now, let's move on with the show with this message from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle, whatever you have, you can definitely listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Star Trek The Return written and narrated by William Shatner. Now, I doubt there are many in this world who have not heard of Star Trek, or William Shatner for that matter. This story takes place right after Captain Kirk met his death at the hands of Professor Soren. The planet Viridian III has been saved, but the USS Enterprise 1701D lies in ruin and one of the galaxy's greatest heroes rests beneath a simple kern of rocks on a lonely hillside. The story opens with Spock coming at last to the grave of his best and dearest friend. Here is a bit of Star Trek The Return, as read by William Shatner. On the horizon, the last radiant spike of the dying sun flared, then vanished behind a distant peak. Overhead, stars emerge from the deepening twilight. Far away, Riker saw Spock bow his head as if lost in memory. 
Riker, go ahead. Commander Riker, this is Kilborn. We're... Her heartbeat, the static cleared, and Kilborn's distraught voice cut through the Viridian night. Can't tell where they're coming from. Two shuttles gone. We need... Riker tapped his badge again. Riker to Ambassador Spock. A moment passed. Then the deep, familiar voice answered, Spock here. Ambassador, there appears to be some trouble at the salvage site. I'm going to have to ask you to remain here while I beam back to check the situation. Of course, Commander. What is the nature of the trouble? I'm not sure. It almost sounds as if they're under attack. Spock said nothing more. Logically, there was nothing more to be said. Riker to transporter control beaming to the salvage site. In the cool tingle of the transporter effect, the grave site shimmered. And then Will Riker beamed into hell. Shatner does an excellent job of telling this incredible story. It has Borg, unholy alliances, and their ultimate weapon is none other than James T. Kirk, resurrected by a mysterious alien science. Why? To destroy the Borg's most formidable enemy, Jean-Luc Picard. Old friends are reunited and ancient secrets revealed as Riker, Spock, Data, and all of the Federation's best and brightest find themselves entangled in a cosmic saga that will test their strength and loyalties to the very limit. Does this sound like a story you want to hear? You can have this audiobook for free today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get Star Trek The Return today. Thank you, Audible. It's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our first set of stories come from repeat storyteller Mason Blue. We first heard from Mason way back in episode number 334. He told us a story about how he was outfoxed by a pack of coyotes. It's a pretty funny story, and if you've not heard it, I highly recommend that episode. Mason Henry Blue. First, let me say that I didn't believe the name either until I had the pleasure to talk to him on the phone one day. He is about as real down-home country as a man can get. Here is more stories from a true American cowboy. Last time I told you about the nuisance that a coyote can be. It's true, but them horses or mules can be downright ornery if you want to know the truth. Many folk think that horses are dumb. That may be true, but when they want something, or rather, they don't want to do something, they let you know. And let me tell you that if a 500-pound animal truly says no, that means no. Here are a couple stories I think you're going to like. My boss told me to go catch some cows that were heading towards the interstate. He made it quite clear that this was a top priority and I should get right on it. Well, I couldn't catch my rope horse, so I had no choice but to get Billy. Billy is my best coon hunting mule. I loaded him in the bed of the truck, tied him off to the toolbox, and headed out. Now that mule knows how to ride in that truck. He leans into the curves and everything. I needed to go to town to air up a back tire, so we stopped at the station, and I ran the hose over the bedsides and started pumping the tire up. Uh, the hose had a little leak, and it tickled Billy's belly. So he decided kicking it would solve the problem. Billy kicked the tailgate off the truck trying to kill that hose. Then, when the hose wrapped around his legs, he jumped out of the truck. 
Now keep in mind, he's still tied to the toolbox that sits behind the cab. Well, that came out, and he tore across the parking lot. The mule banged the toolbox off the gas pumps, soda machines, just about anything there. They hit it. As he scrambled out of sight, snap-on tools were flying in all directions. Everyone in town looked at him like they'd never seen anything like that before. I just knew how much trouble I was in. I finally got them cows back on the range, but I had to use my nephew's forerunner to do it. Now, that's not the only story about Billy. My sister's kids thought it'd be a good idea to hop on him. They were riding him in the pasture, and I was following him with the aforementioned forerunner. Now, there were a few horses in the pasture we were in. All of a sudden, C.D., my friend's reigning horse, 15.2 hands high and full of energy, started after them. Well, Billy didn't like that and tried to bite and kick the beast of a horse. The kids were scared half to death, trying to wave their arms and chase C.D. away, while Billy was running his little heart out trying to get away from this giant. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. That poor donkey was so scared, he was running as fast as he could, and the kids were screaming, and C.D. was thinking she was all funny playing with this donkey. I just wish I had a camera. <laughs> Thank you, Ron, for letting me tell some of my stories. I have got a million of them. Mason Henry Blue, Dallas, Texas. Well, Mason, you did it again. I love these stories, and I'll bet anyone who just heard them does too. You, of course, are welcome to come back anytime you want and tell us more. Thank you, Mason. You're the best. This next story comes from our very own Cody Appadale. Cody has sent in stories and has read some classic science fiction for us as well. Here is his story that he calls Unknown Eyes. I worked as an electrician for a little bit. Since I was just starting, I got to apprentice under a journeyman. We'll call him Joe for this story. Joe and I got to do some retrofitting for an old courthouse. They were upgrading their heating and cooling. Our job was to get power from the main panel in the basement to a new panel on the second floor. The basement was cramped and full of useless equipment. It contained a small portal that led into the crawl space. This portal was lined with pipes that left very little room for someone to crawl through. I, being of a thinner build, got to be the one to shimmy through. The space was the awkward height of being too short to stand, but not necessary to crawl either. The walls were concrete, making cave darkness a real thing. With my headlamp on, I delved into the depths of the crawl space to go around to the section where we needed to feed the conduit through the wall and up through the floor. I took the measurements we needed and yelled them through the small hole to Joe on the other side. To save the battery on my slowly dying headlamp, I would sit in almost complete darkness until Joe asked for the next measurement. After we were both satisfied, I crawled back into the depths of the black. As I rounded the corner, I froze as my headlamp caught two red pinpricks of light on the far side of the building. The next instant, they were gone. I held my gaze to that spot as I cautiously made my way to the center of the portal that held the path to exit. I exited feet first into the main basement. I swear I saw those eyes peering at me again from around the corner. To say that I was relieved to be on vacation when the conduit was installed is an understatement. Cody Appadale Well, Cody, thank you for your story. I guess my first thought would be simple rat encounter, but somehow I get the impression that those eyes meant a bit more to you than rodent infestation. Creepy place that I'm sure I wouldn't want to go into, either. I'm reminded of when I was working for a computer networking company in the late 1980s. 
I was a poor college student at the time and needed some cash. We were hired by the city of Vancouver to wire Ethernet cable throughout the building. I, being the young guy, had to run the cable through the cramped attic. Pulling cables through conduit is a long and painful job. I was getting tired and my knees were killing me. I stood up for just a minute, but I didn't watch my step. My foot went right through the ceiling and kicked a poor fireman in the head who was showering at the time. Not one of my better moments. Fortunately, no one was hurt other than my pride. Thank you again, Cody. Our last story just might be one of the most chilling tales that we've ever had on this show. It was sent in by Angela Bessemer from Tucson, Arizona. She called her story The White Rabbit. We moved to Tucson in 1988 and bought an old single-wide trailer that had an addition built on it. The master bedroom was at the end of a long hallway. Quite often at night, when our children were asleep in their beds, my husband and I would hear something running up and down the hallway. But we never saw anyone there. Other nights, I'd see a large man standing over me on my side of the bed. He wore a red flannel shirt, and he'd just stand there staring at me. My husband never saw him and would pass it off as dreaming. All of us would jokingly refer to our ghost from time to time, but we never felt threatened or even afraid. One year, we asked a friend to take care of our house and feed our cats while we were on a two-week vacation. We were horrified upon our return to find cat poop, cat food, and salt strewn all over the house. We immediately called our friend. Sandy said she would explain everything, but refused to come to our house. Here is what she told us. The first day she took care of our cats, she felt very uncomfortable, unwelcome, and the hairs stood up on her neck. The next day she came over with a friend, whom she did not tell what she had experienced the day before, because she thought she was just being a little silly. When they got to the house, her friend stopped dead at the door and refused to go in. Sandy went in and had all of the same fears again. Later, her friend said that there was an evil presence in the house that did not want them there, and she knew someone who would know what to do. That person advised that they spread salt around the inside perimeter of the house, light sage sticks, and tell the spirits to move on. They did everything they were told, and things seemed to calm down. After a few days, Sandy was in the house when she heard a growl. It was angry and sent chills down her spine. The growl turned into a voice that said, What right do you have in here? She ran for the door, but never made it. She found herself floating in midair and then thrown against the mantel by the door. She got up and made her way outside. She never went into the house again and simply tossed food to the cats. About a year later, we decided to sell the house. Our real estate agent was repeatedly told that potential buyers just didn't feel comfortable with the house. One lady came over with her infant and her mother-in-law, and the infant started screaming as soon as they walked into the house. When they walked out again, the baby stopped crying. At that point, the mother-in-law took the child, went straight to the car, and yelled at her daughter-in-law that it was time to go. That was the final straw for me. I went back into the house and yelled that we were moving regardless of what he wanted. That was our decision, and if he wanted to go with us, that was fine, but he had to quit interfering with the house sale. Two days later, we had a cash offer on the house and moved out. I've heard spirits can attach themselves to tangible objects. I think that's what must have happened with a stuffed white rabbit that belonged to my daughter. I ran across it while we were packing. For some reason, it seemed different to me, and it felt like we no longer needed to keep it. 
I decided to give it to a friend who had a new infant granddaughter living with her. About six months later, I asked about the stuffed rabbit and if her granddaughter liked it. She told me that it was the weirdest thing. But every time she put the rabbit near her grandbaby, the child would start screaming and crying. In the end, she said, we just threw it away. Angela Basimer, Tucson, Arizona. Angela, I've heard stories like this before, and each time I do, I get chills as I read them. To think that the spirit world can cause physical damage? That scares me. Thank you for your story, Angela. It truly is one of the most frightening I've ever heard. Do you have a story that you want to tell on the show? If you do, we want to hear it. It can be about any subject and from any genre. Heck, it doesn't even have to be true. Original fiction or stories from the public domain are quite welcome. To submit them, head to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Fill out the form and soon your story will be heard on the show. Do you have a story but don't want to write it? That's okay too. Just leave your contact information, a brief description of your story, and I'll get back to you. We can write it together. However, if you don't do it, your story remains just that, your story. Why not share it with the world and make it our story? Our featured story for this week comes from the pages of Astounding Magazine, July of 1931. Stoddard found something on a Himalayan mountain that no one expected. An incredible storehouse of diamonds, a madman, his crew of yeti-like creatures, and a plan to rule the world. Last time, we left Professor Norman Prescott and his guide Jack Stoddard facing off against Russian Cossacks in Texas. Here is the conclusion to the Diamond Thunderbolt, read for us by James White. Astounding Stories 19, July 1931. The Diamond Thunderbolt by H. Thompson Rich, Part 3. Two hours later, they were back at the rocket. Led into the shack, which was furnished inside like an oriental hunting lodge, they were confronted at once by Prince Krasnov. Though his aristocratic features were immobile, it was obvious that he was in no amiable frame of mind. So, my friends, he exclaimed, I leave you in India and meet you again in America, all within a matter of hours. It is but an example of our modern progress, is it not? They made no reply. Ha! Huh. You are not sociable after enjoying my hospitality, my transportation? Then suppose we, as you Americans so quaintly say, call a spade a spade. I gave you your chance. You declined it. And what is the result? My beautiful diamond thunderbolt, my immeasurable treasure, is buried forever. Through no fault of ours, put in Stoddard. But buried nevertheless, and my adopted kingdom in revolt. Yet do not think I mourn too much, my friends. Though the game is what you call up, my plan shall go on. Here and elsewhere in the world, where we have sub-headquarters, are billions of dollars' worth of diamonds, supplies for years ahead. We shall not suffer. But you, Professor Prescott and Dr. Stoddard, I have a very interesting fate in store for you. How would you care to make a little scientific expedition to Mars, say? Mars, gasped the professor. Yes, or Venus, or even Jupiter, not to mention the moon. Or how about the sun? That would be an interesting sphere for exploration. We don't know what you're talking about, said Stoddard, growing nettled. Why mince matters? Call a spade a spade if you're going to. What do you propose to do with us, now that you have us in your power? 
The prince paused, drew forth a long Russian cigarette from an exquisite platinum case. I propose, he smiled when he had lit it, to turn over my rocket to you, my fellow scientists, since I shall have no further use for it, and it might be embarrassing to be found with it in my possession. And the way he proposed to turn it over to them, as they had already suspected, was to lock them in it and fire it off into space. Within the hour, the man's diabolical plan had been put into operation. Led to the rocket, the luckless pair were locked within a small metal room somewhere within its recesses. There sounded again the peculiar rasping that told him its doors were being sealed, and then came the roar of that mighty exhaust beating down. There followed the lifting, rushing sensation they had experienced before, and again they were flung violently to the floor by the force of the upward impulse. When the pressure slacked, they staggered to their feet and groped around the dark, stuffy little room. Well, this is the end, I guess, sighed Professor Prescott. I had never thought, with a grim attempt at humor, that I would meet quite such a scientific fate as this. Nor had I, Stoddard agreed. But I'm not quite ready to cash in my checks yet. The game isn't over. He was pacing around the room, knocking on the metal walls with something that gave back a strident ring. Have you any idea what composition this stuff is? The professor rapped on one of the panels, felt of it. Aluminum, I would say. Nothing so lucky. If it were, I could cut it like cheese. But duralumin, probably a very light, strong alloy. And what I have here is a hunting knife with a can opener on one end. If I'm not mistaken, we'll be out of this sardine box before long. Whereupon he applied himself to the thin metal wall of their cell, working determinately while Professor Prescott held his cigarette lighter for a torch. You see, duralumin yields to heat like aluminum, he exclaimed, as finally his knife thrust through. Now then, let's get the can opener working. The progress was slow but sure. Within an hour, he had cut out a jagged section some two feet square, through which they squeezed into an equally dark corridor. Now then, Stoddard's mood was exultant. There must be switches around here somewhere. There were lights, I remember, so let's find them. Once we get a little light on the subject, here, called the professor, who had groped down the corridor with the cigarette lighter. How's that? As he pressed a switch, a row of small bulbs glowed overhead. Fine, was the answer. Now let's see if we can find the engine room, or whatever they call it. Jubilant now, they continued on down the corridor, which ended in a flight of stairs. I fancy it must be below, said Professor Prescott. From what I've seen of experimental models, the propulsion impulse must originate from the base. So they descended the stairs, entered another dark corridor, found another switch, and pressed it. And thus they proceeded, lighting the interior of the rocket as they went. And as they descended, the roar of the exhaust increased in volume, indicating that they were nearing its source. Presently, they entered a large, circular room with an illuminated dial at the far end. Drawing near, they saw a confusion of instruments that for a moment left them dazed. While Stoddard studied them in bewilderment, Prescott circled the room till he found a switch. Pressing it, he produced a brilliant flood of illumination. Now then, let me have a look at this, he said, returning to the dial. Professor Goddard once explained to me the workings of one of his experimental models. The motive force must be some liquefied mixture, possibly oxygen and hydrogen. Some of these instruments, most of them in fact, must be valves. He touched one, turned it, and the rocket responded with a sickening burst of speed. No, that won't do. We're going plenty fast enough now. He touched another, and they slacked off dizzyingly. Well, there are two controls anyway. Now then, how do we steer this thing? That is the next problem we must solve. But though he touched this instrument and that, 
producing weird effects, their course continued in the direction set. And meanwhile, they were hurtling outward through space at a rate of speed he knew would presently carry them beyond the gravitational pull of the Earth. Then, as he grasped and swung down a curious lever that worked in a quadrant, they felt a violent lunge to the left, and for a moment it seemed they would shoot to the ceiling. Good God, gasped Stoddard. What's happened? Nothing. Only that I found how to steer this wild steed, cried the professor exultantly. It was really quite simple, he explained, as he eased up on the lever. In application, it was a development of the gyroscope principle, that a wheel revolving freely within a freely suspended frame tends to make the frame revolve in the other direction. You see, the rocket is the freely suspended frame, he went on, while this lever controls a gyroscopic wheel somewhere. To set it spinning to the right causes us to turn to the left, and vice versa. But you almost stood us on our heads a moment ago. How did that happen? Simply because I threw the lever too far to the right. We are in interstellar space, obviously, where every change of direction involves an adjustment of equilibrium. And if Stoddard didn't exactly understand, being first a Secret Service man and only secondarily a scientist, at least he showed his ignorance no further. If the professor could bring this astounding machine back to Earth, that was all he wanted. Prescott said he could, he thought, providing they had fuel enough left. So, for the next few minutes, while the younger man held his breath, the professor labored with the various instruments on that complicated dial. Now then, I think we're headed back, he said at length, relaxing. But we've got to have visibility. Otherwise, we will land with a velocity of about 20,000 miles an hour, which is what I figure we're making at the present time. Good Lord! gasped Stoddard. I'll say we've got to have visibility. Wait a minute. Let me look around. He searched the room for further instruments, to find nothing that in any way met the purpose. But even as he returned dejected, the professor cried out, Here, I've got it. Take a look at this. Bending over a small table beside the dial, Stoddard saw mirrored in its ground-glass surface a hazy circular panorama that at first had no significance. But as he continued to peer down upon the scene, certain familiar aspects loomed out. It was the Earth, and what he was looking at was a view of the North and South American continents. For some moments, Stoddard stared at this amazing panorama in silence, saw it grow rapidly clearer as the careening rocket plunged like a giant shell toward the earth. My God, he whispered at length in awe. Do you think you can ever check our speed? I think so, the professor replied, busy over his instruments. But where do we want to land? How do we know what state we were in? Whereupon Stoddard told him of that Texas license plate. But we don't want to land anywhere near that fiend Krasnov, he added with a shudder. I suggest, if it's possible, that you pick out some aerodrome, preferably in the western part of the state. For if I remember my geography, Texas isn't mountainous in the east. I will do the best I can, said Prescott grimly. There followed tense minutes as the panorama in that ground glass narrowed and grew more intense. Now they could see only North America. Now only the United States and a portion of Mexico, and now only Texas. Back, back, cried Stoddard, as the rugged land loomed up, spread into a panorama of towns and ranches. We're descending too fast. We're bound to crash, unless... But already the professor had touched the ascending valve and swung the steering lever. Up they zoomed again. Once more, a portion of Mexico was visible on the glass, and all along the international border now they could see a winding thread of silver. The Rio Grande, exclaimed the young geologist. Just follow it up toward its source till we come to El Paso. There'll be a landing field there. Yes, undoubtedly. The professor was working in abstraction over the unfamiliar controls. 
Now, if I can just hold us on our course. He succeeded, and presently a white city gleamed over the curving rim of the horizon to the northwest, the tall chimneys of its smelters throwing long shadows from the lowering sun beyond. In a minute or two, they were over it, at a height of perhaps twelve miles. And now, as they began descending, its patchwork of buildings and plazas unfolded like some great quilt below. There's the field, cried Stoddard, pointing in the glass to a wide, clear space on the outskirts. Can you make it, do you think? We'll know soon, was the grim answer, as Prescott worked frantically now with his valves and levers. It's a matter of balancing off our flow of gases, of holding up buoyancy to the very last. A little too much, or not enough, and... Breathlessly, as they descended, Stoddard peered into the glass. Now a scene of excitement was visible below. Figures could be seen gazing up, waving their arms, running about this way and that. They must think they're getting a visit from another planet, said Stoddard. Or that the end of the world has come. Maybe it has, for us, agreed the professor gravely. I'm afraid we're going to crash. I can't seem to... Whatever he was going to add was lost in a sudden rending concussion that flung them violently down and plunged the room into darkness. Staggering to his feet a moment later, bruised and shaken, Stoddard gasped out, Professor, are you there? Are you all right? A groan answered him, and for a moment his heart sank. But then came the reassuring call, Yes, all right, I guess. And you? Okay, let's get out of here quick. An ominous hissing sound beat on their ears as they groped their way toward the door. Evidently escaping gases from the deranged mechanism, thought Stoddard. The floor rose at an angle, indicating that the rocket was half over on its side. They found the door and struggled along the twisted corridor toward a flight of stairs that would lead below. Found it, descended, and groped along another dark corridor, seeking an exit, when suddenly, around a bend, daylight confronted them, and to their joy they saw that one of the main doors had been burst open by the impact. Approaching it, they peered out, to be greeted by an awed group of officials and mechanics from the field. As they climbed through, dropped to the ground, the group retreated, taking no chances. Back! called Professor Prescott, warning and reassuring them with a word. Then, turning to his companion, Come on, Jack, run! This thing is likely to explode at any moment. Following this advice, Stoddard raced from the rocket with the rest. At a safe distance, he turned and peered back to see it standing there at a crazy angle, dust and fumes issuing from under it in a blast that was hollowing a deep crater to the far side. Even as they looked, the strange craft quivered, tottered, and fell over on its side, and the next instant was enveloped in a blinding sheet of flame that brought with it a dull detonation and a blast of dazing heat. The party backed still farther away. A nasty mixture, oxygen and hydrogen, muttered the professor, feeling of his singed eyebrows. We got out of there just in time, Jack. I'll say we did. Stoddard agreed with a shudder. By now, the higher officials of the field were on the scene, among them a number of army men. Curiosity ran high, not unmingled with indignation. Who were these strange visitors? Where had they come from? What did they mean by endangering the lives of everyone with their damned contraption? Inquiring for the commandant, they were taken to him. Major Clark Hendricks, USA, and Stoddard briefly outlined their astounding story, producing credentials, whereupon a squadron of fast military planes was assembled. From the way they described the mountainous region where the rocket had first landed, mentioning the town Martin's Bluff, that Henry of the ancient Ford had named, the Major declared that it must have been the Guadalupe Mountains, a hundred miles to the east, and sure enough, a government map showed such a town there. 
So it was that presently the squadron lifted into the late afternoon skies with Major Hendricks in the leading plane, accompanied by the two weary adventurers. Swiftly the squadron winged eastward. They reached the mountains in less than an hour, and circled them in search of that little wooden shack which Prince Krasnov and his Cossacks had made their rendezvous. It was like finding a needle in a haystack, and for a time Stoddard despaired of success. But those rugged mountains were an open book to the plains circling high overhead, and with Martin's Bluff once located, the rest was not so hard. At last, as twilight was falling, they found the shack and brought their planes to rest near it. But as the party approached the shack, after posting a heavy guard over their planes, they saw that it was deserted. This, after all, was only what Stoddard had feared, but nevertheless they forced their way inside, and there, had Major Hendricks had any doubt of their story, it was dispelled. As Stoddard had told them, it was furnished like an oriental hunting lodge, with evidences of the recent occupation of the Russians on all sides. But where were they? Had they got away, or were they hiding somewhere? Proceeding from room to room until they had searched it thoroughly, the party paused, baffled. But not for long, for suddenly Stoddard discovered something that gave him a clue. It was a barred door within a closet, covered over with clothes and uniforms so as to be fairly well concealed. On battering it in, they found that it led into a passage below. As the party entered the passage, leaving further guards above, it became obvious that what they had found was the shaft of an old mine. It led down abruptly, for a while, then more gradually, with many windings and twistings and ending presently in another barred door. This they in turn battered in, to be greeted suddenly by a volley of rifle fire that dropped three of them in their tracks. Stoddard was one of those who fell. Bending over him, Professor Prescott lifted up his head. Jack, he called. Where are you hit? Answer me. I, it seems to be in the shoulder, came the weak reply. If you've got a handkerchief. The professor produced one and staunched the flow of blood as best he could, working with the aid of his flashlight. Meanwhile, ahead, the crash of pistols and rifles continued to split the stillness of the passage as the attacking party pressed forward. There, that does it, gasped Stoddard at length. Help me up. I'll be all right. Prescott steadied him to his feet. They continued on. Now the firing ceased, and in a moment Major Hendricks appeared at the head of his party. Well, we've got them he said, saluting Stoddard. How are you, old man? All right, was the gritted reply. Let's have a look at them. A flashlight was swept across the stolid group of Cossack prisoners. But as Stoddard peered into one face after another, he realized that Krasnov was not among them. You haven't got the leader, he said. See here, you birds, he addressed the Cossacks. Where is he, eh? If they understood, they gave no indication of it, but shook their heads sullenly. Well, damn it, we'll find him. Stoddard wheeled and strode past them. Give me three or four men, Major. I'll smoke out that Russian bear. He must be here somewhere. Hendricks sent the main body above with their prisoners and gave him the men he wanted, putting himself at their head. You'd better go on up too, Professor, said Stoddard, addressing Prescott. You've risked enough in my behalf. But the older man shook his head. No, I'll come along if you don't mind, he insisted. I want to see the end of this thing. It was an end that came with dramatic suddenness. Pausing before a barred door some fifty paces down the passage, they were debating what their next move would be, when suddenly it was flung open. Come in, gentlemen, came a suave, ironical voice. Sorry my servants were so uncivil. In the glare of light from beyond, Stoddard and the professor saw that it was Prince Krasnov. He stood there, unarmed, smiling. Is this the fellow? rasped Major Hendricks, his automatic leveled. It is, said Stoddard. 
Slowly, cautiously, they followed the man into the room, which in reality was merely the end of the passage sealed off, though its walls were richly paneled and it was luxuriously furnished. Pausing beside a small, heavy table, he swept his hand over it, indicating a heap of rough diamonds that must have represented millions. Merely a fraction of my treasure, gentlemen, he told them with a deprecating shrug. I hadn't quite finished storing away the last shipment when you interrupted me. He strode to one of the walls, drew out a small drawer from a built-in cabinet, and dumped its glittering contents on the table with the rest. All around the room, Stoddard noted as he stood there swaying, were other cabinets dotted with the knobs of similar drawers. And this, gentlemen, is but my American sub-headquarters, the prince went on. In Siberia, in Brazil. But why bore you with the multiplication of my now useless wealth? Tell me instead, my good friends Professor Prescott, Dr. Stoddard, how come you back here after I saw you safely on your way earlier in the afternoon? Because I happen to have a knack with can openers, and my colleague is rather adept at machinery, Stoddard told him, while Major Hendricks here is quite a hand at geography, not to mention aviation. A question or two, which they answered briefly, and Krasnov had the story. Ah, my poor rocket, he sighed. But it is fate, I suppose. Kismet, as the Turkish say. Still, I deserve a better fate than to be captured by a pair of American professors, when the secret service of the world was on my trail. Then cheer up, said Stoddard, gritting his teeth to keep back the pain of his throbbing shoulder, for I have the honor to represent Washington in this case. At that, the prince scowled darkly for a moment. Then he brightened. Kismet again. I might have acted differently had I known that. But, well, I drink to your success, Dr. Stoddard. Whereupon, before they could restrain him, he lifted a vial from a shelf over one of the cabinets and downed its contents. A diamond dust cocktail, he smiled, replacing the vial. The most expensive, even in your country, of costly drinks and the most deadly. But Stoddard knew, as the doomed nobleman stood there facing them in stoic triumph, that diamond dust in the human system was as slow as it was deadly, and that the desperate gesture had been futile, so far as justice was concerned. There would be ample time, in the weeks Prince Krasnov of Imperial Russia still lived, to round up his international allies and stamp out the remnants of their amazing ring of diamond smugglers while as for Professor Prescott, he was thinking with what amazement the members of his expedition back on Kinchinjunga would receive the cablegram he would dispatch that night, informing them that Stoddard and himself were safe in El Paso, Texas. I hope you enjoyed that story in its three parts. Please send me your thoughts on this because I worry sometimes about playing these longer stories. While I know the stories are good, waiting three weeks can be trying, I'm sure. The author of The Diamond Thunderbolt was H. Thompson Rich. Not much is known about him except that he was born in New Jersey in 1893 as Harold Thompson and passed away in 1974. It appears he mostly wrote for the pulp magazines and is credited with about 24 short stories and novellas. Harold was also listed as being a custom house broker. I have no idea what that is. Welcome back to Old Time Radio Commercials. This time we clean things up with two famous products that we all know and love. This first one came from 1958, and the quality of the sound is astounding. I doubt Mr. Clean needs any more introduction. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Floors, doors, walls, halls, white sidewall tires, and old golf balls. Sink, stoves, bathtubs, he'll do. He'll even help clean laundry, too. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Can he clean a kitchen sink? Quicker than a wink. Can 
Can he clean a window sash? Faster than a flash. Can he clean a dirty mirror? He'll make it bright and clearer. Can he clean a diamond ring? Mr. Clean cleans anything. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. Our second one is just as famous as Mr. Clean. When Ajax was introduced in 1947, the slogan for the original scrubbing powder was Stronger Than Dirt. Use Ajax, the foaming cleanser. Clean pots and pans, just like a whiz. Ajax cuts grease faster than any other leading cleanser. Use the pain, the elbow tax, when you start cleaning with Ajax. Ajax really polishes as it cleans. So use Ajax, bum, bum, the foaming cleanser. Bump the dirt, right down the drain. Bum, 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 bum. My gosh, they're right. Foaming action Ajax makes even the dirtiest pan shine like new in a jiffy. So use Ajax. That's all I have for this time. If you have any favorites or recordings of old-time commercials, let me know. Episode number 422. We have some folks that I'd like to thank for this one. Paul Knight, Mason Henry Blue, Cody Abadale, and of course, Angela Bessemer. You guys made this show a show. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that should fit every need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing that you can do is to tell your friends all about it. Please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. This is what makes podcasts grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.